As I said, for the past, past few weeks, we've been preaching on the gifts of the Spirit, the manifestations of the Spirit. We've talked about two attitudes toward, toward the gifts of, uh, uh, of the Spirit or uh, char the char charismata, which is the Greek word for gifts. There is a, a charismaphobia, if we want to call it that, which is a fear and a consequent neglect or rejection of God's gifts. And then there is a charismania, which is an obsession with the more spectacular gifts and the abuse of the same. We have stated, and we encourage you to go back and listen if you want to get a good background on, on the gifts as we dealt with that in the first few weeks. But we've stated that we reject any manifestation contrary to the word of God or to the nature of God as described in the Bible. Furthermore, ecstatic activity by itself cannot and does not constitute proof that something is of God. And finally, where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are manifest, Jesus Christ is always glorified. Amen? Always glorify. Jesus is Lord will be the message. A true spiritual gift is a God-given capacity through which the Holy Spirit supernaturally ministers to the body. This is not, I want to just emphasize this, this is not our natural talents and abilities which we have and we must yield to the Lord's work. But this is an ability not native within us. It's an ability that is given to us. Spiritual gifts are given to enable us to do what we cannot do in and of ourselves. Secondly, these gifts are given to profit the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Your ministry gifts build me up. My ministry gifts build you up. I need your gifts and you need mine. Amen. The third thing we learned about gifts is that the list of gifts mentioned in verses 8 through 10 are by no means an exhaustive list. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4 all mention gifts. 19 or 20 different gifts are mentioned. Speaking gifts, revealing gifts, power gifts, leadership gifts, evangelism gifts, helping gifts, etc., etc. All special endowments of and from the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about the first three gifts mentioned in verses 8 through 10. And let me just quickly talk about them. In verse 8, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge are mentioned. The word of wisdom is a word given by the Holy Spirit for a specific situation or problem. It does not mean that one is necessarily a wise person. It is a word of wisdom, not an abiding word. Wisdom. It is a wisdom given by God through the Holy Spirit for the need of the hour. And I thank God for every time that he's ever given a word of wisdom in that need of hour. Can you say amen? With the word of knowledge, the same principle applies. It's a word inspired by the Holy Spirit that reveals knowledge about people, circumstances, or biblical truth. It doesn't mean that you're summa cum laude. It means that, the, that God, the omniscient one, reveals to us by his spirit things we could not otherwise know. That's why some of you might wonder, why, and wonder what it is when God wakes you up in the middle of the night to pray for a specific person because you know they're in trouble. That's a word of knowledge, amen? Verse 9 mentions the gift of faith. This is a supernatural faith imparted by the Holy Spirit that enables the child of God to believe the Lord for extraordinary things. A supernatural faith to believe. This gift will often accompany a particular burden or a call that the Lord has placed in one's life. And we talked about that last week. Now let's look at the remaining gifts. Uh, those we did not cover last week in verses 9 and 10. And let's begin with uh, the gifts of healing. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. So what is the gift of healing? What's the gifts of healing mean? 
It is a restoration of health by supernatural means. In other words, God does it. Amen. And let me just say right up front, we believe in divine healing. We don't believe in divine healers. There's only one divine healer and his name is Jesus. But we, all, we do believe that God gifts and uses people to get that accomplished. It's, through, it's Jesus Christ, make no mistake about it, that's doing the work, not a person. This is not a healing by medical knowledge or practice. Certainly God can use uh, and does use medicine to heal. And we thank God for all the medical advancements uh, that we, we know today in our modern world. But this gift, like all the gifts, is a supernatural bestowment. For, let me use for an example here, Luke, who was a doctor. Um, he was with Paul on many of his missionary journeys. He, he actually wrote the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles, and the book that bears his name, the Gospel of Luke. He was with Paul when he was shipwrecked on the island of Melita. And when the father-in-law of the chief man of the island was sick, it was Paul, not Dr. Luke, with all of his medical knowledge that God used to bring healing. Let me read Acts 28, verse 8. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. The people were healed by supernatural power and not by the efforts of Luke, the physician. Amen. In fact, in Acts chapter 3, the apostles made sure that everybody knew that it was not they themselves who were the healers, but where the healing came from. And it says in chapter 3 of Acts verse 12, and when Peter saw it, he Answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel you at, ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? And it was, and what he's saying is it was not our ability. This was the ability of the Holy Spirit. And I think it's important to note. That not only did they deny that the gifts of healing had come from their own ability, but revealed the true source of healing, Jesus Christ. And then further used it as an opportunity to preach the salvation of Jesus Christ. And the result was thousands were saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 4 says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Therefore, the gift glorified Jesus Christ and not men. And the men made sure that it glorified Jesus Christ and that people weren't flocking to them as if though by their own power or holiness they did it. Would to God we had more people like that today. So that Jesus would receive all the glory for whatever the work is that is accomplished. Now one more matter on, on this before we move on, on from healing. And I will only be able to give quick uh, quick definitions of these, of these gifts this morning. But I've heard people say, well, if he has the gift of healing, then why doesn't he just go to a hospital and just empty out the hospital? Anybody ever heard anybody say that? Maybe you said it yourself. Well, simply because verse 11 states that God distributes his gifts as he wills. In fact, uh, the, the, the apostle Paul who was used by God in the gifts of healing many, many times. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, he said, Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. So this shows us that even the apostle Paul did not have miraculous healing powers to use at his own disposal. He could only uh, give a gift of healing if it was God's will and God's timing. And let me just say this this morning. God is always in control of everything. Amen. He's always in control. That's why I have a real problem with advertisements that say, come see all nine gifts in operation tonight. It's as God wills. Can you say Amen. Chapter 12, verse 10 says, to another, the working of miracles. The word miracles is the plural form of the wor uh, word for power. 
uh, dunamis, as it's used, uh, for example, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, referring to the Holy Spirit coming upon us, ye shall receive power. It means power, inherent ability, and is used of works of a supernatural origin and character such as could not be produced by natural agents and means. Now, let me just stop here. And I just want to say, that I want to interject something right here. If you have noticed throughout this series, whether it pertains to witnessing or having fruit in your life, love, joy, peace, or, or gifts to minister to the body of Christ, we can do none of those things without the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And folks, I want you to understand something. This is the whole purpose of preaching such a message today. And what we've been preaching is there can be, there, 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 let me just say, Christianity is a supernatural religion. If you want to call it a religion, you cannot live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit. You cannot minister to others without the power of the Holy Spirit. And you certainly can't live a godly life without the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Can you say amen? So let's go back to the miracles, the working of miracles. The term miracle is used very, very loosely today. Huh. I mean, we have miracle drugs. Miracle diets, miracle lipstick, <laughs> miracle ab machines, etc. But real miracles go beyond what's humanly possible. Miracles refer to acts of God against the laws of nature. For example, Jesus turning water into wine or raising Lazarus from the dead or how about walking on the water? There can be no natural explanation for these events. And I think everyone agrees. These are miracles. But there is something else here that is interesting regarding the working of miracles. It says the working of miracles. The word working is uh, the Greek word energia. It's where we get the word energy. It's used in the New Testament almost exclusively for the work of divine or demonic powers. In other words, supernatural powers. Anthony Palma suggests this gift is used especially in connection with the conflict between God and Satan. These acts of power bringing defeat to Satan might include judgment of blindness on Elimus in Acts chapter 13 and of casting out devils as seen in numerous Bible passages. Folks, it is foolish to think that the powers of darkness are any less active today or any less powerful today than they were in Bible times. To be sure, Satan is doing everything he can possibly do to disrupt, to destroy, and to deceive the masses. You can be sure of that. Oh, how we need to be able to deal with those powers. Listen, I want you to know something. The Bible says greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church and no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Jesus said ye shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. He said in my name ye shall cast out devils. Folks, I don't know if I can properly explain the working of miracles or the working of powers, but this much I do know. God has provided a means to counteract and overcome all the forces of evil. Now you may think, you may think you don't need supernatural power to deal with a supernatural foe. But friend, if you've ever had a true encounter with evil, you'll think right, right quickly, you'll think differently. It is heartening to know that God will give us what we need when we need it, when we are encountering supernatural forces that are arrayed against us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Praise God. Verse 10 again, the next gift is to another prophecy. Prophecy uh, uh, refers to words which come from the Holy Spirit to convey the message of God to the hearers. 
To prophesy is to speak forth the mind and the counsel of God. It is to receive and communicate a message from God. Among the gifts listed in 1 Corinthians, prophecy is one we are to most desire and covet. According to chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Follow after charity or love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Why? Verse 3 says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. The Amplified Version says it like this, Speaks to men for their upbuilding and constructive spiritual progress and encouragement and consolation. Paul further deals with, uh, 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 with the why in verse 4. He says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. The church is edified when prophecy takes place, and that's something that we all should desire. Unfortunately, prophecy has been misunderstood, misinterpreted, and misused. However, we must never allow that to cause us to do what the Bible forbids us to do when Paul says, despise not prophesying. It can happen because of the excess and the abuse, but we're not to do that. It is a wonderful gift of God, and when used in a scriptural manner, it will have a profound effect upon the church. When the church needs a word of wisdom for a difficult situation or a word of knowledge to help minister to someone, the Holy Spirit may use the gift of prophecy in conjunction with the other gifts to edify the body. The Lord may anoint a believer to speak forth to the body, not premeditated words, but spontaneous words of the Spirit to uplift and to encourage and to incite to faithful obedience and service. And furthermore, to bring comfort and consolation. At times, our worship uh, leaders and pastors may operate in this gift. Uh, uh, as we preach, prophetic words may come forth. This is not to say, and I want you to understand, that all preaching, as some believe, is prophesying because that's not true. Some people say that, that, uh, that good preaching is prophesying, but that's not the case. However, the Lord will at times give the minister an unpremeditated truth or application provided by the Spirit, something not studied right in the midst of the preaching. Furthermore, there are times when God will give someone in the congregation a word from the throne of God of exhortation, edification, or comfort. You say, well, how do you know when that happens? Well, when prophetic utterances come forth, the Spirit of God will sweep over a congregation. New scriptures are not given. They never are given. They cannot be given. The, the, the new doctrines are never taught, for this is contrary to God's word. But heartstrings are touched. Worship ensues. Dryness disappears. Sluggish feet are ready. A demand to march. Heavy hands are lifted up in praise. Tear Fearless eyes will be moist again. A downcast spirit will leap for joy. Why? Because God has spoken and the Holy Spirit has spoken. And when he does, you know it and the church is edified. I'd like to make some observations about prophecy. Number one, it will always be in agreement with the word of God. Always. Always. Number two, not all who are used in the simple gift of prophecy hold the office of a prophet. Prophets prophesy, but not everyone that prophesies holds the office of a prophet. Maybe we'll get to that office of a prophet at some point. Uh, number three, New Testament prophecy is more of, of foretelling uh, th than foretelling. It is a proclamation, not prediction, although prediction is not entirely absent, uh, as, as the case in the prophecy of Agabus the prophet. However, it is important to note, no guidance was given, uh, and only the message, only the warning. God's Word and the Holy Spirit are always our guides, never a prophecy from some guru somewhere. 
hear me now, unless the prophecy confirms what God has already revealed to you in his word or he's already spoken to you, you are to reject it and not accept it. The Bible says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the Holy Spirit always leads and guides us into what? All truth. That's what I want. I want the truth. So the purpose of true prophecy is not to satisfy our curiosity about the future, but to stir our hearts to do the will of God. Amen. That's how you know it's of God. Amen. Notice the next gift given is listed immediately following prophecy. Interesting because because in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, it says that all prophecy should be judged. Right? And so here we find in verse 10, to another is given this, a discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is a spirit-given ability to properly discern or distinguish whether something is of the Holy Spirit or of another spirit. The gift reveals the true nature of the source of any behavior professed to be of God. Some people say, well, you know, I have or he has or she has the gift of discernment. Well, there's really no such thing. This is not the gift of discernment. It's the gift of discerning of spirits. Every child of God has to one degree or another the ability to discern. And the more we know God's word and the closer we walk with God, the more discerning we will be. But this is not the gift. That's not the gift. That's not the gift. That's just discerning. That's just discernment. The gift is the ability to discern spirits. This could be something that's of God. You can discern that or of the devil. You discern that. Or it may even be simply the flesh. You discern that. I might add, this is not the spirit of suspicion or fault finding, nor is it a self-righteous spirit. It is a God-given ability from the spirit that enables you to discern what spirit is manifesting. And I can tell you as a pastor, this is a needful and tremendous gift for the church. You say, why? Because Satan often appears as an angel of light. Have you noticed that he doesn't come with a sign around his neck wearing his pitchfork and his tail red suit and and, and, and having his pitchfork and behold, here I am, I'm the devil and I'm here to destroy your life. He doesn't do that. He comes as an angel of light. We need the gifts of discerning of spirits. There can be lying spirits in the mouths of prophets. Uh, Satan can work deceiving miracles according to the word of God. This is why we need the gift of discerning of spirits. In Acts chapter 16, we have an account of Paul discerning an evil spirit that's in a young girl employed to hinder the work of God. Acts chapter 16, verse 17 says, The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. Notice that she's telling the truth there, which showed to us the way of salvation. She seems to be saying the right things, but of course, it was a deceiving spirit. I'm going to tell you, all error comes on the back, comes in the church on the back of truth. You hear me? And why we need to be able to discern what spirit something is of. Verse 18 says, And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Paul dealt with the spirit involved, not the person. He spoke directly to the spirit and he cast it out. That was a power encounter, wasn't it? We see two gifts actually operating there. The the last two that we will look at together this morning is found in verse 10, to another diverse kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues. These two must go together because it's the only way the church can be edified. Chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians verse 4 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. But you have to read on. I would that ye all spake with tongues. That's what Paul said. But rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Oh, but keep reading. Except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. If properly regulated, the gift of tongues with the gift of interpretation will edify the same as the gift of prophecy. 
The problem is, there's not a lot of interpretation. But when it's done right, when it's, when it's, when it's regulated right, it's edifying just like prophecy. That's what Paul's saying. So we must be careful. We must be careful if we're on the charism, charisphobia side that we don't belittle this gift. Paul's not belittling the gift. He's regulating the gift. You hear me? The fact that the Spirit bestowed the gift is sufficient evidence that when exercised within divine regulations, it is neither unnecessary or useless as some would claim. Though admittedly, sometimes exalted beyond in, in some circles, we must be careful not to belittle. Come on now. So what is it? Diverse kinds of tongues it is a Spirit-inspired utterance like prophecy. Only in an unknown language, unknown that is, to the speaker. Interpretation of tongues is a spirit-given interpretation that communicates the content and meaning of the utterance to the church. And something to notice is that is the gift of interpretation, not a word-for-word -word translation. Interpretation means it is a declaration of the meaning. Hear me? There's so much more to be revealed about this gift as you read on and I encourage you to do so in chapter 14 right sandwich in between the love chapter <laughs> because we must have love amen there's much more said about how it's to be regulated but remember don't belittle it and there's much said about praying or praising let me, and, and, and let me add this when someone is, is speaking out in the church in tongues, it should always be interpreted without fail. But if somebody's down at the altar praying and you hear them speaking in tongues to themselves and to God, they're edifying themselves. It's not for the church. Come on now. You hear me? That's something we need to understand. We might be, somebody might be praising the Lord and it's just between them and God. They're not speaking out to the church. You just praise God yourself. Hear me? Come on, we need to understand these things. Paul said, I would not you to be ignorant or without understanding or to neglect huh, or reject God's gifts. Somebody said to me this morning, and this is much of the reason why people will, will uh, they have problems. Somebody came up to, to, to him one time after he'd been saved, and the man said, do you speak in tongues? And the man said, no, no, I don't speak in tongues. And he said, well, uh, have fun in hell or something to that effect. Because, because it was a church that was, uh, uh, that, that was Jesus only that believed that the only way that you can be saved is to speak in tongues. And that's why people are doing this. And no wonder. But do you think God's pleased with that? Just because somebody has, is abusing something or some denomination's gone wrong or gone wild with something doesn't mean there's not a real, and I want what God has, Amen. Certainly, the gift, this one especially, but not this one only, but this one especially has been abused and misused. But I will conclude my thoughts on tongues with the words of the Apostle Paul found in 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. And whether we understand it fully or not, if God gave it, I'm not fighting against it. I will, however, insist, as always, that not only that gift, but all gifts are in accordance to God's word. Can you say amen to that? As one writer put it, sad that what was an integral part of the early church is now only a movement today. Indeed, it is sad. Sad that only those in a particular movement practice it, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly, when the gift should be a part of every believer's life. All that God has. I'll close with chapter 12, verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts. The best gift is the particular gift needed at that time. Huh? If I can tell this right, brother. I thought he gave a great example, brother. 
Aker said, you'll have to correct me here. He said, if you're out in a, on a below zero night and you're uh, 30 below zero and you're in, stuck in a ditch somewhere, in a hole somewhere, you don't need a brain surgeon right then. Uh, what do you need? You need a tow truck driver, right? So the best gift right then was the tow truck driver, right? Not the brain surgeon. Be careful what you belittle. It might be the very thing you need. Huh? You see, if discerning the spirits is needed, I want to covet that gift. Oh, is it ever needed? <laughs> if a word of wisdom is needed, oh, I covet that gift. If edification, exhortation, or comfort is needed, oh, God, may we prophesy. If healing's needed, well, I think you get the picture. I think you get the picture. My final word, my final word comes in a form of a prayer. Lord, we need you. We have a big job to do. Give us those gifts needed to get the job done. Whatever we need, God, please provide.